So I might just start by saying I'm here with Anna Maria Leon, who's an architecture historian and associate professor in the history of art at the University of Michigan. Welcome, Anna Maria. And I'm also here with Andrew Hersher, who is an associate professor of architecture at the Taubman School of Architecture and Urban Planning. And your specialty, Andrew, is on spatial politics of violence and human rights, which I find quite interesting. Um, we're here today to talk about uh, Michael Sorkin's um, point number, it's actually point number 108, which is the architectural impact of colonialism on cities of North Africa. And I thought this would be a great opportunity to take this um, from North Africa and really bring it to the continent of North America and talk about colonialism and its impact on cities in North America. So we're doing a little twist on his, on his actual initial point. Um, but uh, Andrew, I mentioned that you uh, had a specialty working in spatial politics, and I know Anna Maria, you've explored uh, the discourses of power and resistance and how publics relate to each other. And so um, I'm interested in this relationship between those discourses in a sense, but you both had come together in the last year's Chicago Architecture Biennial on a research installation that was called the Settler Colonial City Project. And I wondered if we could start by just um, talking briefly about the aim of this research collective. What were you trying to do with this project? Well, I, I guess I, I can begin. Um, it, to the extent that settler colonialism is uh, remembered in a settler colonial project like the United States, it's typically um, remembered or registered as something in the distant past, something that's finished, something that's over, something that um, maybe has little bearing on the present. This, is, this, of course, is the position of settlers, not the position of uh, indigenous people. Um, and if, if you read um, the, the theory of settler colonialism, you, you read, as in Patrick Wolfe's words, settler colonialism is a structure, not an event. It's something that, 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 that continues to um, uh, uh, um, uh, um, form and, 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 and transform uh, over historical time. In other words, something that's still very much with us. And one of the, I think one of the chief aims of the Settler Colonial City Project was to begin to look at cities in, um, uh, first in the United States, um, that exist in this kind of settler colonial present, but in, in ways that are typically um, re-described or neglect neglected or disavowed, at least in conventional architectural or, or urban contexts. Mm. And one, if we were to dive into one of the objects um, in the installation, uh, it's a very subtle move, but it basically takes the placard, a historical placard on a building, and uh, alters the text in a certain way. So what is the intent behind this heritage sign, the work of that, that project? Yeah, well, in, in the United States, uh, which is a settler colonial state, heritage, at least in its institutional forms, is enmeshed with the settler colonial project. And we wanted um, to somehow foreground that, and we found a wonderful way to do that in the Chicago Architecture Biennial, because the site of the Biennial, the Chicago Cultural Center, is listed as a national historic landmark, and that, that listing is marked by um, these very venerable blast, brass plaques at the building's two entrances. Now, the land that was seized from indigenous people to make the site for the Chicago Cultural Center is a kind of counter heritage, at least in the context of settler colonialism, a counter heritage that settler colonialism ignores. So we decided to mimic the design of the National Historic Landmark plaques and make a sign that declared that this property has been placed on Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi homelands by the settler colonialism of the United States. Um, and we decided to uh, our, we make a, a neon sign that we could um, display at the entrance of the Chicago Cultural Center. This turned out to be something the Biennial Administration didn't want to include in the exhibition. And so it ended up at the American Indian Center of Chicago, with whom we collaborated in, in, in our work. And it's now found a home in the center's lobby. Um, Ana Maria, do you want to maybe continue the story from there? Yeah. The... Um... 
I mean, we they were thrilled uh, and uh, at the American Indian Center, and uh, we we were just very gratified to see how folks there have appropriated um, the sign and extended it. Um, if you see the pictures in the site, um, you can see that there, the, the sign is now next to a door and folks have started adding sort of intertribal affiliations. So uh, other tribal affiliations that perhaps are not from the area, uh, but now live in the area. So in a way, the sign is active and growing. Um, and and we, I, I think it's the best, uh, ultimately it's the best um, destination for the sign itself because it's still there. The rest of the installation had to be taken down, uh, but the sign is still there and it's been, uh, you know, it's, it's, in a way it's no longer, it, it's not our sign, right? It's, it's a community sign. Uh, and it was fantastic to work with uh, Heather Miller and the American Indian Center uh, on that project. Mm. What I think to, of, I, yes, oh, please, go ahead. I was going to yeah. pick up on what Anna Maria said and, and mention that this, the site of Chicago is, was, the home, was and is the homelands of the Anishinaabe people, but the American Indian Center um, has something like representatives of 145 different tribes uh, in its membership, and this has to do with the, the kind of history and politics of, of, of relocation in the United States. And what was particularly moving and beautiful was how um, the, 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 that sign was claimed by both Anishinaabe and non-Anishinaabe uh, 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 people. I think what's really interesting about this heritage sign is that it's an everyday object that we pass by in the city quite often. And, and so it calls attention to that in that way. And another object that I find really interesting that is, is a symbol in a sense is this brass seal in the city of Chicago's uh, floor, the city's uh, seal in the floor. Um, and I'm curious if you could talk a bit about the assumption of, assumptions of heritage that you are recontextualizing with that object, with the seal itself. Well, the first of all, that seal is the only that that seal, which is also a seal that you see in every police officer in the city of Chicago, right? It's the seal of the city, um, contains within itself the only representation of an indigenous person in the whole building. Um, in other parts of the building, there. Are signs in many different languages, but there's no sign in Anishinaabe. There's no indigenous representation other than the depiction in that sign. And there's a very telling transference of violence itself in the sign, because the sign depicts the United States as this sort of baby floating above the seal of the US. Um, and it's per the code of the city, it's the indigenous man who has who holds the bow and arrow, so holds the weapons, right, and holds the the the, the markers of violence. Um, but the sign also makes clear the narrative of settler colonialism. It shows a ship that's headed towards uh, a sheaf of wheat, which is not an indigenous um, crop from the Americas, right? Uh, it replaces the shikawa, which is you know the the sort of wild onion that the city owes its name to, uh, and the ship is basically a cargo ship that's coming to take that crop. So it sort of reveals the narrative of of the city itself and transfers the violence to the person that's actually being eliminated, right, uh, or the cultural group that's being eliminated. Right. And the the you, you have touched upon the two points of the building that were of great pride. Um, the, 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 the seal itself, uh, were the, 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 the folks that, the, the caretakers of the building are, are very attached to the seal and they, they insist on cleaning it several times, polishing it, and they're sort of rubbing it off in a way, mm. uh, literally rubbing it off. Um, so we, we, we felt this was um, just the, the, not only in the representation of, of the seal, but in the way the seal is sort of cared for, protected, and at the same time violently 
erased and, and sort of uh, th there's a violent ex violence exerted upon it with you know stepping on it and, and polishing rubbing it away uh, it, it shows that sort of uh, civilized in quotation mark way in, in which settler colonialism sort of uh, displaces violence through uh, th with the excuse of civilization this narrative of civilization yeah. Yeah, I found it very interesting, the idea of replacing the original ramp or onion with wheat, which is a prosperous, economically capital-intensive kind of crop where the onion and the ramp is not. I think they're, they're very subtle moves in a way that becomes symbology that really changes how we interpret history in a sense. Mm -hmm. They are subtle moves, but they point to large capital operations. Right uh, to the elimination of cultural groups in order to appropriate land and turn it into a site of extraction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's another work on the fourth floor, and it's text on some glass windows saying, "You are looking at unceded land." And you describe in the catalog um, the, the geography of colonial landfilling and water seizing, and I love those phrases, water seizing, just taking it away. Um, there's, there's a US Supreme Court decision that kind of lays bare a bit of a moral ga gap. And I'm curious what's significant about this project to you and why letter these particular windows? Why, why those windows? Yeah, well, the city of Chicago occupies both indigenous land that was ceded by coerced treaties, and also land that was never ceded. We, this is a history we discovered in a really wonderful book called Imprints by a Potawatomi historian, John Lowe, who we ended up collaborating with on our project. Mm -hmm. And we, we wanted to somehow uh, visualize this history in our intervention at, at the biennial. So to make a long story, the story that John Lowe tells very, very short, when, when the final Treaty of Chicago was signed in 1833. The shoreline of Chicago was marked by Michigan Avenue, which runs along Lake Michigan. After the Chicago fire, uh, rubble from the fire was used to extend the city um, and make landfill beyond Michigan Avenue into what was water when the treaty was signed. In the, in the late 1890s, um, the Pokagon Band of Potawatomi, who were displaced and then ended up coming back and were living in the southwest part of Michigan, decided to file a lawsuit laying claim to this landfilled land because it didn't exist when they signed the Treaty of Chicago. The, this case ended up at the U.S. Supreme Court. The U.S. Supreme Court could not find for the Potawatomi because that would have allowed um, in, in a kind of not only the Potawatomi to claim a large part of downtown Chicago, but would have allowed indigenous tribes throughout the United States to claim um, extremely valuable land. So the, they, 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 the Supreme Court claimed the Potawatomi abandoned land that actually didn't exist when they were expelled from what became Chicago. And the Chicago Cultural Center, which sits on Michigan Avenue, therefore occupies ceded land, but it looks out and offers views onto unceded land, the land that was created by landfill. And so we designed an installation that on, on, on the set of windows that face this unceded land to make this usually ignore geography very visible and vivid. I, I, I would just quickly add that we sort of co-founded SCCP as a research collective um, and we, we work, uh, we're, you know, we, we collaborate with a large group of folks with different skills. Um, one of those, you know, a, a couple of those folks are uh, Emily Kutil and Tyler Schafsma, who embarked on sort of visualizing mm -hmm. um, much of the research on um, land seizing and uh, the very narrative that John Lowe um, has written. Uh, and in the making those maps and in the conversations that we had with them, we realized sort of that in, in sort of looking at those maps that there was the opportunity to have those that we we knew the cultural center had windows that looked onto michigan avenue um so so that's how we sort of started thinking about using the windows and then on the other hand uh, the the sign of the installation was done by Anneli and craig reschke a future firm who also put us in touch with jeremiah chu from some all none who 
help us sort of finesse the details of the font and the sort of the, the installation signs. Mm. I was interested in, in that, in the signage and also using the windows because these black words or the white words are very strong on a, on a transparent surface. And I'm curious about that idea of transparency and what that relationship is to the kind of history you're unveiling or bringing, calling forward in a way. Is there a relationship? I, I think we the, the 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 first thought was actually to have two signs, um, which were you are standing on occupied land, and the other one was you, you are looking at unceded land. So so the idea is to sort of position you position the observer um, mm -hmm. in relationship to the land and the history of that land. Um, so after going through the building. Um, having a sense of, until then, um, visitors have read signs, um, but this is on the fourth floor. It's usually the, the last um, installation that, that you would encounter. Um, and, and there's a sense of the visitor sort of becoming aware of their own role and agency of their own body as uh, in, in most cases a settler body uh, mm -hmm. looking towards this land and understanding where they are positioned and their own responsibility. I might also add that all our signs uh, were transparent. They didn't block mm -hmm. anything. They mm -hmm. didn't replace anything. Um, what they did was if you, if you took the time to read them, they allowed you to see through them and to see uh, uh, what you see through them in a different way. So I, I, it, it, in, instead of trying to suggest a, a, uh, a, 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 a new narrative of the Chicago Cultural Center in the city of Chicago that would replace the old one, I, I, I think at least uh, the attempt in our project was to offer an alternative narrative and, 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 and give, um, the visitors to the biennial a choice, uh, or, or at least a, a sense that there are competing narratives to understand um, this very grand monumental building and, um, um, and a grand and monumental city. Um, the, the, the hegemonic given narrative and also um, um, a, a, a one that justifies settler colonialism and naturalizes it, and one that, 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 that looks at settler colonialism more critically. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, yeah, just, I would just add that we, we wanted folks to see through, see the actual materials. We were speaking about the marble, the wood, the mahogany wood, right? So you're reading the text and actually encountering the material object behind that text. But at the same time, we, th there are often you will encounter parallel signs with the official narrative. And when those signs were in place, we, with the positioning of the sign and the proportions and the size, we responded and echoed that narrative so that the observer and the visitors would, would sort of see clearly that they were being offered the, an official narrative and then there was another one that was echoing it and responding to it. Mm -hmm. And there are many more projects we could talk about. I mean, the, this leads to the library, but I'm not going to go there right now. I do want to ask, though, as just kind of a last question, where does this research lead next? What's the way forward from what you've been exploring and discovering with this research, the Colonial City Project, and uh, where it, the Settler Colonial City Project, and where it goes forward from here? What's next? Or how does it, how does it evolve? Well, I, I would just say that we're, so we're both um, trained as architects and also trained as historians and we teach. And I think we, 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 we have discussed how this project is a teaching project and also a history project, but it's also architecture. So it takes from uh, different types of um, disciplinary tentacles. Um, we, we're both engaged uh, in, with different research on settler colonialism. And right now we're co-editing um, a collection of essays um, 
and at the same time we're separately each working on um, just research as historians. Uh, so I'm I have some work on the um, uh, disappear or the destruction of the Big Mound in St. Louis and as a long process of settler colonialism. Um, and Andrew, I don't know if you want to say something about sure. your research and <laughs> yeah. Um, I've been working um, for quite some time in Detroit um, in community-based contexts around uh, water justice, housing justice, and related issues. And um, one of the uh, kind of um, outcomes of the Settler Colonial City Project for me is thinking about this work in Detroit as um, actually work on a settler colonial city, a city that is kind of hiding in plain sight because we talk about its manifestations in very different terms. In other words, I want to ask, what if terms like gentrification, terms like spatial racism, terms like environmental injustice are describing situations that have emerged from and advanced the settler colonial project? And that's what I'm trying to explore in a new book project. Nice. Well, it's it's marvelous work and it's very important work. And um, thank you for sharing a little bit about the Settler Colonial City Project with us today. Andrew Hersher and Anna Maria Leon. Thank you. Um, I, it was enjoyable to talk with you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your interest. Thank you.